All right, so today is our last day of uh, topics on magnetism. Uh, before we get into the material, I'm just going to preface the fact that due to the last week here, this is one of the areas where things are getting really condensed and cut out. So what we're covering right now is chapter 25, uh, but I can't cover nearly all of it. So it's kind of a, a mix of topics from throughout those chapters, from throughout that chapter today, uh, in particular focused on uh, just like a few things that are strewn about in there. Uh, but some out of chap uh, section one, some a bit out of section three and four, mostly. Uh, so this is kind of the last day with mag magnetic force laws, weird laws about directions and things. So. Uh, all of the uh, all of the uh, kind of hard stuff about magnetism, the stuff that's kind of hard to do online. This is our last day of it, and then we're going to move on to uh, some topics from modern physics that uh, kind of relate to a lot of things in chemistry. So uh, that's kind of where we're going with the last week and a half of the of the course, or last like five lectures. Uh, Colleen is our asks is our next exam. The final, uh, yes, next exam is the final. Uh, you also have one more lab, uh, which will be assigned next week. And uh, including today, there will be six more daily problem sets. So we're counting down here, almost in the single digits for everything. All right, any other questions before we start? All right, so uh, one of the most, the, one of the reasons every physics class studies magnetism at least a bit is because magnetism is exceptionally useful in being a source for voltages and currents. And today I want to uh, talk about why. Oh, one other question. Uh, no, there was not a lab this week. The last lab was the capacitor lab last week, and there will be a ninth and last lab next week. So uh, getting back to where, where I was here. Uh, so today we're going to talk about how we can use magnetism to generate voltages and currents. That's our main, uh, our main goal today. And this effect was originally discovered by Michael Faraday, so it's called Faraday's Law. Uh, Michael Faraday is pictured here. And basically his law stated in words is that if you can get a magnetic field to change, if you can change a magnetic field, so, or I guess we could start, if you can get a magnetic field going through some loop of wire and you, can change, and you change that magnetic field in some way, it will cause a voltage to form in a, wire, in a wire, which we call an induced voltage. And that induced voltage will cause an induced current, depending on the resistance in that wire or whatever circuit it's connected to. Uh, so this voltage works like any other voltage uh, once it's there. Uh, however, engineers sometimes give it a weird name called an electromotive force or EMF. Uh, and the symbol they use is the curly letter epsilon. Uh, but that being said, it is a voltage like any other voltage we've talked about. This is one of those things where you're going to have your, your teacher, uh, me obviously in this case, tell you that they have really strong opinions about a specific thing in uh, their textbook or the subject, something they really don't like. This is my thing. I hate this term electromotive force. It adds extra confusion. All, it's a voltage like other voltages we've talked about, but I'm mentioning it here because if you're following along with the reading, you'll see it in the text, and you'll see this term EMF in the problems for this section. And if you're asked to solve for an EMF, that means you're asked to find the voltage in the circuit. That's all it means. So uh, that moving forward, just with that note, let's move on and talk about the experimental facts that Michael Faraday discovered here. So a changing magnetic field moving through a wire loop uh, 
creates a voltage in the loop. And Michael Faraday, who wasn't really, uh, he was a scientist, but not one that was classically trained. He did not go to college traditionally, and he did not have a background in mathematics. So uh, when he was doing physics, he had this kind of unique way to talk about things, which uh, kind of got around the mathematics in some way. In particular, uh, we have him to thank for the field picture for forces. So the kind of the field filling all of space that creates the electric force or the magnetic force or the gravitational force. Uh, this idea originally comes from him. Uh, and it was kind of, as you can see it, it's now made more mathematical as we use it today in physics. But it's uh, this field model was a result of him trying to visualize forces uh, as he was teaching himself science and physics. Uh, so another uh, thing that he induced is this idea of flux in physics, which uh, is something I want to talk about in the next slide. But his law stated in this idea is that more or less the induced voltage we get uh, from this changing magnetic field is proportional to the total amount, quote unquote, of magnetic field that passes through the wire loop. Uh, and he called this idea the total amount of magnetic field, the magnetic flux. And they use the Greek letter capital phi to represent it. This is a kind of like a hard nebulous thing to measure the amount of a magnetic field because you could draw as many magnetic field lines as you want. But we can write this idea out mathematically. Uh, I'm going to put the main theory equations here next on this slide before I discuss what this idea is. So put the idea of magnetic flux on the back burner for a second and then copy down these equations and we'll use them in a bit. So the two main equations you need for the problems of this section are Faraday's law in mathematical form, which says that this induced voltage is equal to the change in this magnetic flux versus time. So delta phi, delta t. If we then want the current that the changing magnetic field creates, we just use Ohm's law. We have to know the resistance of the wire or the resistance of whatever resistor is in our circuit. Uh, but if we know that, we can take this induced voltage and compute a uh, induced current. So the one thing that's left, though, is to quantify and kind of understand what is meant by this idea of magnetic flux. So set, in words, it's this measure of the amount of magnetic field in a space. Uh, but I'm going to try to explain this with an analogy here. So on this next slide, here we have a fan, right? Pretend the fan is blowing and it's blowing all this air through like a hula hoop or a loop of wire that we're looking on from the edge. So the gold line here is the edge of our, our loop or our hula hoop or whatever. And the blue lines here are the air currents that are passing through the loop thanks to the fan. We could call this effectively the air flux, the amount, a measure of how the air is flowing. So what does it depend on? What makes the air flux or the, flu the air flowing through the loop bigger or smaller? You could kind of imagine it depends on obviously how fast the, the fan is pushing, just how quickly the air is moving. So it should be proportional to the flow rate of air. It should, hopefully you can see, it should be proportional to how big our loop is. So the bigger a loop, the more air molecules we're going to get flowing through the center of the loop. And critically, and this is the harder thing to see, it depends on how the loop is oriented. So for instance here, let me just draw a, let me take my pen uh, and draw, a perpendicular line here. So right now, we could call this the axis of the loop. Right now, it's pointing directly at the fan. If we rotate the loop like this, then 
less air, everything else the same, the area of the loop the same, the flow rate of air the same, less air is going to be able to get through the loop if we rotate it at an angle like this. And you can see this clearly, there's lines that now miss, lines of flowing air now miss the loop. And if I draw the new axis of the loop the way it would point now, I'll draw this uh, in red. It would now look like so, and we could say that we could measure how much the orientation of the loop by the angle we've rotated it. So, for instance, here we can measure it using this angle. Call it theta, like we usually do. If theta is zero, the loop is the axis of the loop is pointing directly at the fan, and the most air will get through the loop. The bigger theta gets from zero to 90 degrees, at 90 degrees, zero air gets through the loop. So this main idea of the total amount of air that gets through the loop is what we call the air flux. And to measure the amount of magnetic field that gets through some loop of wire, we're going to kind of use the same analogy, but just kind of uh, change the, uh, the things involved. But this idea, I think, is thinking about in terms of air and a fan makes it a bit easier to visualize. So now let's take our fan and turn it into a magnet. We'll turn our hula hoop into a big wire loop. And so instead of the fan blowing air, we have a magnet creating a magnetic field. Not showing the magnet here, just showing the magnetic field now in blue. And our wire loop the axis which, of the wire loop, which is this black line, is parallel to the magnetic field. And the loop has a diameter given by B. So we can define the amount of magnetic field flowing through this loop, quote unquote, the magnetic flux, uh, the same way we define the amount of air that gets through that little hoop. It's going to depend on how strong your magnet is, how much, or how big your magnetic field strength is, how big B is. It's going to depend on, how, on the area of the loop, how wide it is. Bigger a loop, more magnetic field gets through. And it depends on this orientation. If we rotate the loop at some angle relative to the field, like shown here, the amount of magnetic field that gets through is less overall. And you can kind of see why it's less, because kind of the effective uh, height or length of the uh, height or length of the loop that the magnetic field sees, again, quote unquote, is less. So from here, by looking at this, we have a way to kind of measure magnetic flux, even though, even though the magnetic field isn't flowing air. Uh, this is an effective way to kind of tell us how much magnetic field is getting through some loop of wire. If we know the area, the angle of a wire loop relative to the field and the strength of the field itself. And we could change this magnetic flux in any of three ways. We could change the magnetic flux by, by increasing or decreasing B. We could change the magnetic flux by increasing or decreasing the area of the loop. Or, and the most important from an application standpoint, we could change the magnetic flux by rotating the loop. And we're going to talk about why that's really important uh, before the end of class. So if we wanted to write a uh, formula describing all of these effects, we could write the magnetic flux as being proportional to the magnetic field strength, proportional to the area of the loop, and proportional not to the angle, but to the cosine of the angle as defined. Uh, and the reason we want a cosine is because as we rotate the loop like, completely around, the magnetic flux is going to decrease and then increase again as the loop keeps rotating. So we need a, a function of the, uh, of the angle that oscillates. Given how we've defined our angle, cosine is the one we need here. So the, the units of magnetic flux are magnetic field times area. Tesla meters squared, which are named after this guy shown here, 
who uh, Wilhelm Edward Weber. Uh, so the units for magnetic flux are called a Weber. Uh, we're not going to be using them much. Again, they really will only really appear in this lecture and the problem set for this lecture. Uh, but the reason they exist is because people don't want to write out Tesla times meter squared again and again and again. Sometimes one of the uh, highlights or one of the uh, best honors in physics or in science is being so famous that people get so lazy writing out a complicated unit that they name it after you. It's like the high point of a physics career. And this guy, this guy hit it. Why did he hit it? Because he invented the telegraph. That's kind of what he's known for. Other than that, probably haven't heard about him. All right, so take away from this, uh, from this, this is most of our uh, theory for the day, is uh, the two equations from the first slide and this one here for calculating magnetic flux. Uh, so our main goal, for today is finding out how magnetic flux is changing and computing an induced voltage and an induced current. One thing uh, we're not going to do here is determine the direction of the current, which is something that talks about in the book, but that's the thing I have to cut out uh, due to time. Uh, so we can compute the amount, we're gonna learn how to compute the amount of current and practice that, but not the direction, which uh, uh, if you're interested, it's talked about in the text, it's called Lenz's Law. And it's a nice, if you happen to like all of the weird direction rules for magnetism, that's another great section to do, but uh, we won't have problems on that in class. So here I have a few, I'm going to post a few problems for you. I'm going, I have three in the slides, I'm gonna do two. Uh, the third one, I will post the slides to Canvas uh, later today and it'll be there for you to look at it. So that, that one I'm not going to do is actually the first one though. It's just a problem with calculating magnetic flux based off some numbers and plugging into this formula. Instead, what I'd like to do is this problem. Start, because it's a little bit more of a thinker one and easier one to do online. So here we have this situation ahead of us that we've been talking about. We have a loop of wire, uniform magnetic field B, passing through the loop. And the loop's at an angle relative to that magnetic field. Uh, and that's the thing we could change. We can change the angle. What angle will give us a magnetic flux that's half the maximum value? The maximum value will be when the loop is fa like face on to the magnetic field. So what angle do we need? Uh, to get half the maximum value. And then we'll talk about it. Uh, I'll let you guys think about it for a few minutes and then check back in with you.
All right, so we have two, uh, two public answers here, both, both saying B. Uh, give me a feeling, you guys, as a class, do you agree or disagree? Do you think it's B? Come on, people, give me some agreement or disagreement. Expecting a text res or a chat response from more people here. Mostly because I like, every now and again, I like reminders that I'm not just talking to myself, which is after spending weeks talking on my computer screen, it's enough to kind of make you go crazy. So, all right. So a lot of people agree. I also ask because this is a problem that gets everyone every year, almost 100%. Uh, the, the three years I've taught this course at Washington College now, almost everyone has always immediately said B. And I am going to tell you it is not B. So think about it again. Go back to this answer. B is not the answer. So of the remaining choices, which one do you think it is? So here's a hint. In order to, if you're rotating the loop, what, and you want to decrease the flux by half, when the flux is maximum, cosine of theta has to be equal to one. When is cosine of theta equal to one half? The other answer you can eliminate here, you can eliminate D because cosine of 90 is zero. That's when the loop will be kind of, well, the loop will be oriented so no, none of the magnetic field lines get through the loop. Yep, all right, so now a lot of the, all of the answers coming in here now are correct. It is indeed C. So the re reason I do this problem is because uh, this oscillatory nature and using the trig function means that this isn't a linear relationship. Cosine's not a linear function. So if you rotate the loop halfway, that's not the point where the total magnetic field drops by half. And the reason why physically is because when you rotate small angles, if you're like just slightly off from the loop being vertical, that doesn't change very much the amount of, uh, the amount of magnetic field that gets through the loop. But if you're really close to the loop being at 90 degrees and you rotate the same small angle, it will cause a huge change in the amount of magnetic field that gets through. So, uh, the uh, effect on the amount of field, magnetic field that gets through the loop gets bigger as you make the angle bigger. And that's why physically the halfway point is not at 45 degrees. It's a, a little, it's a little bit past 45 degrees here at 60 degrees. Hopefully that kind of gives you a physical reason why. But as you go into problems uh, for this section, keep this in mind. But otherwise, if you, if you guess 45, don't worry about it. I expect everyone to say 45. I would have said 45 my first time through the class two when I was a student. So it's one of those non-intuitive things. All right, so let's try one problem here. Uh, we'll try a problem that's a little bit more complicated, but I wanna give you an idea of why we're talking about this uh, before we move on. So it's, Seri this idea of rotating a wire loop in a magnetic field is seriously important in the history of science and engineering and technology because it allows uh, ge electrical generators to work. And basically how we generate electricity in all power plants, regardless of the type, is based on this principle. This is a very simplified picture here. 
where this wire loop is in a, in a magnetic field caused by a permanent magnet. But we might have this wire loop in a, in a power plant connected to a turbine, which is turned by water falling over uh, a dam in a, uh, in a water you know, power plant, uh, by steam from a coal or nuclear power plant, building up pressure, turning paddle, turning uh, wheels in the turbine, which turns a wire loop or a set of wire loops like this. And uh, you can also see like, for instance, uh, if you wanna be more, uh, as you should, if you wanna be more uh, green and uh, ecologically friendly in your energy generation, you could connect a wire loop like this to a wind turbine and cause the wind turbine will be hit by wind, cause the wire loop to rotate in the magnetic field. So, uh, this is why this idea of changing the angle of the loop to change the magnetic flux is important because changing that angle will change the magnetic flux which creates a induced voltage and induced current which can then be used like any other voltage and current to power devices and this is what makes electrical generation on a large scale possible it's what allows us to have you know electricity coming out of the walls of our house whenever we want it rather than needing to go out and uh, power everything off of car batteries. Uh, it's also why the electricity that we use, that we get from the wall is oscillating. It's not, it's a changing voltage and current because as you rotate this loop, that cosine becomes positive and negative, which changes the sign on the voltage you get. So really, this is kind of a simplified version of a problem that seems like, you know, you might be asking, why are we doing this? Uh, but really, in, uh, it's not, an, uh, it's not out there to say, this particular problem is the reason why the modern world exists. Very much so. So it's worth talking about at least one day in a survey course on physics. And uh, it's also why changing the angle is the important thing to, uh, to talk about because it's much harder to change the strength of the magnetic field or the size of the wire loop after you've made it but you can change how the loop is oriented pretty easily. So here's our, our second problem, which we'll finish the class with today. Uh, this one will help with, uh, and I could just kind of uh, work, I'm going to kind of work through this one to give you guys kind of an example of how this goes. And hopefully it'll give you a good idea of uh, of how these problems work. So here we have a wire loop with uh, a movable side on the loop. So really you could kind of think of this, maybe it's a copper wire. This orange part is a copper wire. And then on top we have a conducting bar that we could slide back and forth to change the size of the circuit and thus the area of the loop. The vertical side of the loop here is 19 centimeters. And uh, the other side of the loop is unknown, but we'll call it X. And so what we're told here is that we, we take this uh, movable bar and we push it inwards at a velocity uh, shown as V on the diagram. And given the resistance and stuff, we wanna use Faraday's law to calculate if we have this magnetic field out going through this loop and we push this bar inwards, uh, what type of voltage would we generate? So this is another example of a simple electric, it's a simpler version of an electrical generator where uh, we're taking the energy of us pushing this bar and Faraday's law converts it to the energy of the current moving through the wire. It's a less practical uh, generator, but it allows for a good problem to do some kind, do some computation with Faraday's law. So here as a reminder, or kind of if you can't see it, the loop as far as this problem is talked about is here. Uh, so what I have circled. The wire that's outside the bar doesn't, it's not connected to anything, so it doesn't carry current. The current in the problem will go around this loop here made by the moving bar and the wire to the left. So as we push the bar inwards, we're making the loop smaller. So we're decreasing the area A. So magnetic field's not changing, the orientation or the angle of the loop is not changing, just the area. So 
if we want to find the induced voltage and current, what we have to do is uh, calculate our new area. So here in the problem, we move the rod four centimeters, or I'm sorry, four meters. So we don't really know how much we change the area, but we know we change this one, this bottom side here by four meters. It starts out at some unknown value X. And after we're done pushing it, we push it four meters, so it changes to X minus four. So our goal here is to be, compute the change in magnetic flux, uh, divide that by the time it takes, so here that's one second, and then use that to get an induced voltage. Any questions on the setup of the problem before I move on? Okay, so our starting equation is going to be the magnetic flux equation, which here is going to simplify the cosine. The loop is always oriented such that the axis of the loop, the axis passing through the center, is parallel to the magnetic field. That makes uh, the angle zero and cosine of zero is one. So the magnetic flux is just the known magnetic field times the area of the loop. So that's how we're going to compute phi. But what we really need is delta phi, the flux before we push the bar and the flux after. So that's going to be B times delta A. And you don't want to let it, we don't know X, so we can't compute A final and A initial directly. Uh, so that might give you pause. But as with all of these problems like this, if you do physics enough and you do enough of these problems as you guys have done now, you kind of have to have faith that the thing you don't know is gonna cancel out. So let's just plow forward without stopping and hope that this unknown initial length X just drops out. And uh, I will assure you it will. So let's compute delta phi. So delta phi is gonna be magnetic field times A final minus A initial. And I'm just going to plug in things here. The width of the loop stays 0.19 meters in both cases. And here on the first term, you'll see we can distribute the 0.19 meters through. So multiply through by 0.19 on this first term. And we'll have 0.19x minus four times 0.19 minus 0.19x. And the two terms with x indeed end up canceling out. Leaving us with a delta phi of minus 1.1 Tesla meters squared or minus 1.1 Weber's. So if we want the, our induced voltage is the change in the rate of change of this magnetic flux, delta phi over delta t. So if we want the induced voltage from here, it's an application of the first formula from today's class. So here using the symbol for, the symbol I hate for electromotive force, uh, delta phi over delta t, Delta T was one second. We did all this pushing on the bar in one second. So it ends up giving us 1.1 volts uh, around this wire loop. The wire has no resistance, but they did tell us in the problem that the bar we're pushing does have a resistance. So that allows us to get the current. Once we have this voltage, we just treat it like it's a battery in the circuit. It's a voltage source like any other. So we want the current, it's voltage divided by resistance. The resistance in the problem was 0.55 ohms, so our induced current is two amps. So again, not really a practical generator because, you know, if you're holding on to this bar with two amps of current moving through it, you're not gonna have a good time trying to generate electricity this way. But it 
this is a good problem where it shows you how we can create a voltage by changing the area. When you get to your homework problems uh, for today's class, they're all kind of based on this problem. That being said, there are different ways to change the magnetic flux. You might, there might be problems where you're changing B. Might be a problem like this where you're changing A, or you might be changing the angle of the loop. So uh, be prepared for any of those things. But fundamentally, all the problems eventually go back to calculating this voltage and thus the current from the Faraday's law equation. The induced voltage is delta phi over delta t, change in flux over change in time. I'm going to kind of, you guys don't have any questions. Uh, really the reason we're doing this in class is for some cool applications that are out there in the world around us. So I'd like to just finish with a few slides about where you might see this out in the world. As I mentioned, there is the, uh, this is the basis for how we generate electricity and how we've generated electricity for the entirety of the 20th and 21st century. Uh, where, where you also see this appear is in things like magnetic braking that are used on, used on a lot of uh, semi-trunk, semi-trucks and uh, especially high-speed trains and also on roller coasters. So magnetic braking makes use of Faraday's law uh, and it makes use of the fact that this magnetic field generating a current doesn't, it, uh, it also applies, it makes loops of current in solid pieces of metal as well as loops of wire. So when this effect happens and when the magnetic field passes through a solid piece of metal, uh, even though you don't have a wire loop, you still create loops of current. They're just kind of less well-defined, they're kind of more nebulous. Uh, but the effect it's from this is caused by the same effect. Uh, the magnetic field causes this induced voltage inside the metal of the disc, which causes these localized loops of current that we call eddy currents, kind of like eddies on a pond or kind of looping currents that you might see out in a, a river that has rapids or something. That's where the name comes from. But these eddy currents, the fundamental idea here is that the magnetic field uh, generates these currents, but it's really the motion of the metal uh, that gives the currents the energy. So the magnetic field here isn't violating conservation of energy or anything. It's really just used as a method to transfer energy. So Faraday's law takes the energy from the motion of this disk, and as the disk moves through the magnetic field, effectively you're changing the area or the part of the disk where the magnetic field exists, which creates these new currents at different points along the disk. And essentially what that does is take the kinetic energy of motion and convert it to the electrical energy of the current uh, rotating in the disk, eventually causing the disk of metal to heat up. So this is a way that's used to stop, uh, stop high-speed trains and big, big moving objects like this, where you don't actually need brake pads and you don't need contact between the brakes and the axle. You just need to bring two magnets fairly close to the moving piece of metal. Uh, so if you've, uh, the reason why I mentioned roller coasters is because if, you've, if you're someone who's ridden a roller coaster before, you've gone to Six Flags or another, another amusement park, and you've gone on a roller coaster and you're right near the end of, end of the ride, and you're getting back to the point where the roller coaster is moving really fast, and you're getting back to kind of the station where people get on and off out of the carts, you'll, you can feel that there's this, as soon as you get close to the station, there's this immediate smooth but not rough slowing down of the roller coaster. That's due to this magnetic braking effect. Other places you see this are, uh, I don't know if you know someone, perhaps a parent or a relative, uh, they tend to be expensive, so probably college students uh, don't have these. Uh, often they're out of price of many college professors, though one day I hope to have a stove like this. They're, they make uh, in Faraday's indu Faraday induction-based stovetops where uh, the cooking surface does not actually heat up. Instead, what it does is generate a changing magnetic field. And then when you put a, uh, a metal pot or pan on top of one of these surfaces, it creates eddy currents in the bottom of the pot or pan. And due to the resistance of the metal that that's made out of, 
it causes, uh, causes all those currents to heat up the pan, allowing you to cook your food. Uh, and it's really kind of cool because the only thing that heats up is, uh, is the pan or the pot you're cooking with and immediately the area underneath it. But the stove by itself doesn't actually get hot. So, which is kind of cool. The other benefit of these things is that they're really compact. So for, and they heat up really quickly. So uh, for instance here, you can see in the top photo that this induction cooking surface doesn't need much underneath it. it, gives you more shelf space. So if you end up going into kitchen design work, induction stovetops are really, really cool. Uh, if you're designing a kitchen for a physicist, they are preferred. Uh, however, they're super expensive. But they're becoming more and more common every day. The last and the most important application of this effect is uh, that it finally allows me to answer for you the question I left you with before spring break as to what is actually waving inside of a light wave. And we have both uh, Michael Faraday, but also Scottish physicist uh, James Clerk Maxwell to thank for this. So this idea of a changing magnetic field creating a voltage uh, Remember that a voltage is really a different way, speaking in terms of energy, to talk about an electric field. So we can equivalently talk about Faraday's law as being the, uh, as that changing magnetic field creates an electric field that drives this induced current. And that's kind of shown here in the upper left. The magnetic field are going into the page, they're the blue X's, and they create an electric field around the loop, so in a direction perpendicular to the magnetic field. And yes, if you're asking, there is a right-hand rule effect here that is uh, we are skipping, but that determines the direction that you, uh, that you get. That then goes back to uh, Lenz's law. And that electric field drives the current around the loop. So we can equivalently say that a changing magnetic field creates an induced electric field. Well. Maxwell, uh, working around the same, more or less around near the same time as Faraday, though I forget the, the years off the top of my head. This is him, a picture as a younger guy before he, before he got a job uh, as being a beard model. Uh, Maxwell said that changing electric fields, that this effect could happen in reverse. If we could change an electric field, that could also create a magnetic field, uh, kind of by like the inverse process. So that is called, uh, that kind of reverse or inverse law is called the Maxwell-Ampere law. Though we're not going to cover it mathematically in class, we just kind of want to take the concept. And what this means is that if we have a changing electric field somewhere out there in space, somewhere near it, it will create a changing magnetic field which will then create a changing electric field nearby, which will create a second changing magnetic field, and then a third changing electric field, and so on and so forth. And what this allows is to create this kind of a chain effect that moves through space. And these are called electromagnetic waves. So here, one a, uh, the blue arrows are our changing magnetic field which create changing electric fields one spot over, which then create a new changing magnetic field one spot over. And what it allows is for this propagating disturbance in the fields, in the electric and magnetic fields. Just like a water wave moves through water, we have this wave moving through the electric and magnetic fields that are out there in space. These are called electromagnetic waves. They're transverse waves because they oscillate perpendicular to the direction they're moving. Uh, but fundamentally, they follow all the laws of waves. And this is what uh, Maxwell showed that light, or predicted that light, radio waves, uh, all types of radiation that we have out there, infrared waves, microwaves, X-rays, UV rays, are all different types of this type of wave, a wave in the electromagnetic field. The thing that separates them is their frequency or their wavelength which are defined just like you would expect from when we discussed waves earlier in the semester. 
Uh, so Faraday's law and Faraday's result allows me to finally answer this question for you. What is it that's waving inside of a light wave? It's the electric and magnetic fields that exist out there in space. And it's kind of a, one of those cool moments in physics where you see, and I know, I know what you're thinking right now, that all of the moments in physics are cool, Dr. Kaiser, all of them. How could this be any cooler? But the interesting thing here, and the thing that's really unique is that there are these ideas, electric fields and magnetic fields, these were these things built to describe forces, to describe two balloons that are attracting or repelling to each other, or to describe why a, a compass needle is attracted to a wire or to the North Pole. These are ideas that are completely separate from light and optics. They're part of whole separate models. But Maxwell was able to show that, no, indeed, these, like, this model we built is bigger than we thought. It allowed us to predict this new thing about light. And that's, it's a good example of this like moment of science being really powerful, not just describing something we've seen, but predicting something new that we didn't know before. In particular, one of the really weird, interesting things here is that these constants we've been using in magnetism uh, and electricity, so the permittivity constant for a capacitor, and the permeability constant for determining the strength of the magnetic field. Maxwell's theory showed that these two numbers combined in the way shown here should give us the speed of these electromagnetic waves. And if you take the SI numbers as we have them, you do get three times 10 to the eight meters per second, the SI, the speed of light in SI units. And I've written out here the, uh, I'll leave this to you guys to check, but I've written out here the units uh, for, the permittivity and permeability, just in terms of the base units, amps for currents, kilograms, meters, and seconds. And if you want to exercise in unit analysis, you can show that all of the units uh, cancel out with the exception of meters per second. So permittivity times permeability does give you a speed. Uh, and that speed is the speed of light, which then connects to all of the advanced physics from Einstein's relativity and E equals mc squared, that's the c in that equation. And, but it all fundamentally connects to this idea of electric and magnetic fields, which started out as this way to picture uh, these kind of invisible forces in space, but now kind of taken on a life of their own and determine the light we use to see the world around us, which in the end, I think is pretty cool even in the grand scheme of things, even by the high standard for coolness that we, that we set up in this course. So this kind of, this lecture right here brings us to kind of the end of what we would call our, our overview of classical physics. From here on out, starting on Monday, we're going to talk about some of the ways in which the models of physics start breaking down. And the new models that we have, how we have to modify them, to work in more specialized or more specialized circumstances. We're gonna focus mostly on a brief overview of properties of atomic physics and the physics of subatomic particles. So thank you all, have a good weekend. That's the end of our lecture for today. Uh, I will, uh, the homework for this section will be due on Monday as usual. <laughs>